Hey folks, welcome back to another Dice Tower preview. I'm Mark, and today we're taking a look at Tiny Epic Game of Thrones, which is brought to you by Game and Games. It's for one to four players, ages 18 and up, and games generally run about 45 to 60 minutes. Prepare to navigate the perilous world of Westeros with Tiny Epic Games of Thrones, where alliances are fragile, betrayals are common, and the fate of your house hangs in the balance. You will assume the roles of the mighty houses of the Seven Kingdoms, each vying for power, influence, and control of the Iron Throne. As you step into the shoes of these iconic characters, you'll face challenging dilemmas, engage in intricate political maneuvering, and wage epic battles for supremacy. Will you forge powerful alliances with other noble houses, or will you plot their downfall to seize their lands and resources? The choices you make will have far-reaching consequences, affecting not only your house, but the entire realm. In Tiny Epic Game of Thrones, you will utilize an innovative limited action dice mechanism to strategically choose actions such as plot, whisper, event, march, and sail, with the option to follow other players' actions. Players will be engaged with every turn. Furthermore, you will wield the immense power of your respective houses through a versatile hand of multi-use cards that allow players to plot against the influential houses of Westeros, orchestrate grandiose events, and partake in exhilarating battles. You will wage war across all of Westeros, sieging castles, taking lands, and forging crucial alliances, all for a chance to sit upon the Iron Throne. After six rounds of play, one player will emerge as the Lord of the Seven Kingdoms and be crowned the winner. Can you outwit your rivals and ensure the survival and prosperity of your house in the unforgiving Game of Thrones? So there's a multitude of ways to play this one. You've got cooperative, solo, competitive, and competitive is really the base game, which is what we're gonna be focusing on. But in that cooperative game, Ice and Fire, the expansion you bring in, you bring in the White Walkers, you bring in the northern part of the map, you have the Ice Dragon, they're moving ever forward, bringing on winter because winter is coming. It adds a lot, it forces all players to work together and gather their forces in one place so they can attack and eliminate the White Walkers. So it adds a whole nother level of challenge but let's take a look at this competitive game. So you'll see here you have Westeros, the whole map. And on the map you have all the different zones where you have your castles of all the respective families and so forth and areas that you're going to be trying to conquer. You have your score mat, you have your round tracker which has some really useful information on it. And as you move through the different rounds, these six rounds, you'll see that you'll score after round three, after round five, and then finally at the end of the game. Just giving you a multitude of ways to get points throughout. And again, below that though, some really useful information to help you through each of the rounds and so forth. And then you have your action board or action mat where you'll be placing dice and performing the actions in this game. Really neat way this works, we'll take a look at, but you'll be drafting those dice and performing actions and then everyone will get to perform an action. So again, everyone is gonna be engaged throughout the game. Now, there are really five different types of resources in this game to be mindful of. First, we have the plot cards, and we'll be taking a little bit closer look at these, but just know that they do multitude of things. Not everything on the card will activate. It depends on what action you're performing. will determine which part of the card you're gonna be using. And then we have castles and gold. Now, the interesting thing here is that the more castles you gain, the more alliances that you have, and the more powerful you become, but that also means the less gold you can have when you're trying to perform different actions and deploy your troops or your power tokens to the board. And power tokens is another type of resource in the game. Again, these are the troops, the forces you're gonna bring out to the battles and so forth. So, and you'll pay a varying cost as you move down the line of these. And through the course of getting points in the different rounds, you'll see below that you'll be able to get those points once you've uncovered enough spots for each of them. And then finally, we have alliances with the other houses. As you gather those alliances and their banners, it's going to add another type of resource that you'll be using throughout the game. And that brings us to our house boards. Now, there's two sides. This side you'll be using as a player. The other side is for non-player characters, which we'll get to, but this side, you'll see that you're tracking at the very top your gold and your castles that you've gathered. Also, you have your power tokens on here. And again, this is where you'll be tracking the different points you might be gathering in the different rounds of the game, as well as some resources, things like that. So very useful, obviously, for keeping track of everything. Now, the other side is when it's a non-player board. So 
These will give you the option to get more power tokens as you gain alliances, gain their banner, and become even more powerful in the game. So you'll be tapping into most of the families every time you play the competitive version. And of course, there's heroes in the game. Your heroes for your house, in that, with the exception of House Aaron. There is no hero there. But even the non-play characters, potentially you can grab that hero and use it with their card and their miniature. But for you, the players will have appropriate hero like for the Lannisters, you have Jamie Lannister. And there's a card that you'll be putting in your hand. These won't be laid out unless you played them in that particular round. But you'll be using these, obviously, they're more powerful characters to have on the board as you go into battle and so forth. All of the houses have a unique power to change the dice, so to say. So like the Lannisters, they can change a dice face to the event icon for doing actions and so forth. But there are many different other ones. And for the non-players, they become alliance abilities when you have aligned with them and have their banner and so forth. So lots of different options here. And the thing about alliances is that they are fleeting. You can gain the power tokens from one of these non-player characters and put them in your pool on your board and you're going to have some checks at the end of the round to see if you have alliance with them. Whoever has the most of those tokens is going to have that alliance and get that banner. So it can be fleeting to determine who is going to currently be aligned with that house. But again, it does make you more powerful when that happens. So the active player in this game is known as the Hand of the King, obviously. And you're going to take the five dice, you're going to roll them. And then starting with player on the right and going counterclockwise, you're going to draft those dice one at a time. And whoever the hand of the king is will end up with the two dice. Now, there's variations based on three and two players where you have slots at the bottom of the action board where extra dice will get placed. So everyone will still have all those actions to perform and so forth. So you'll draft those dice and then you're going to start off by placing them. So the hand of the king will be able to choose which of those two dice to place out in the board. So you, again, as the first player, will have the choice of all the possible actions. You have to place one of those dice, which just means the icon on the dice is going to be what everyone else will get to do. The main action that you select from the board is only for you to perform. And it's important to note that even though you're performing this action that you've placed the dice, the icon on the dice is the follow-on action. And even you, the active player, can choose to not do that follow-on action if you want. But in turn order, you'll go around and everyone will get to do that action if they so choose. And then the extra dice that you have will pass to the next player and you'll move on from there. So let's take a brief look at these different actions. We're not gonna do a deep dive, but you have recruit, you have march, you have sail, whisper, plot, and event. Now, all these different actions are gonna work in a way where they may use different parts of the plot cards. But first, let's take a look at Recruit. You're simply gathering your power, your troops, from your main board or from a non-player board that you have an alliance with and move them out to an area that you control. Now, the important thing there is that depending on where you're pulling from will determine the cost, obviously. It's different for the non-player characters versus your characters. As you get more and more of your troops out, the more expensive it's gonna become. And it's important to note that as you're recruiting and bringing out more troops, you can only have up to three of a particular house in any one zone. So keep that in mind as you're bringing out new troops and moving around the battlefield or the map, so to say. So moving is the next thing you're gonna be doing. You've got marching and you've got sailing. So marching is about moving troops up to two domains adjacent to each other and moving them around small pieces of the map. But sailing is all about moving whole map tiles. So it is sailing around different oceans, giving you the option to move up to two there as well, really gives you a way to move around the map pretty quickly. You cannot move to the north though, because that is all frozen and that is where the White Walkers are. But you can move down around the bottom of the board and up, it gives you lots of options and ways to traverse the map very quickly. And for both the march and the sail action, when you land in a domain where there's a castle and there's no opposition there, you can claim that castle and put it on your player board. Again, gaining in strength because eventually you'll need at least three castles in order to take on King's Landing. But the thing here is that again, it reduces the amount of gold that you can hold. Whisper is a very straightforward action. You're just discarding cards to gain gold, not your hero card, but your other plot cards to gain gold and then refresh your hand, basically. And then we have the plot. And then this is where the plot cards start to come into play. In the top right corner is the icons you'll use for plot. And you're going to be grabbing either power tokens from non-player characters, your character, or other players at the table. You'll be taking them from their pool and putting them into your pool on your player boards, your house boards. And there's varying costs around this based on where you're pulling from and different aspects of the game. And the card may have one or two banners on it. And you can use both or just one. It's up to you. The last action is events. Now at the bottom of the card, 
you'll be able to activate the text when you do an event. And in this one, we have Safe Passage, and you can do this up to three times. They may not pre because it's like cost. You have to pay cost to do these things. Here, you're going to have to pay three gold to gain one victory point. But again, you can do this up to three times. And with all these actions around plot cards, you will have to discard them once you've used their abilities and so forth. So that's just a basic look at the main actions, but of course you're gonna be battling. So when you move into a domain where there is another uh, house that you are not aligned with, you will be battling back and forth. And it's just a numbers game there. So each of your power tokens are gonna to be worth one point and your heroes are worth two. So you'll total those points up, but then you also get to play plot cards so in the top left corner of the plot card will be a number and that will add to your overall strength when you go into battle and you just compare and whoever has the most is going to be the winner, right? So it's that straightforward. Now there's other icons here as well, like a flag for retreating, or you may get an icon that allows you to go to the deck and draw a card, kind of a push your luck. You hope you get a better card for that battle. In this case, we got a two. Now, if you're the attacker, when you play that plot card, you get to play it for free. However, the defender will have to pay the cost associated with that plot card in the top left corner. So there's some trade-off here about how you battle and best use your cards and so forth. But also, if you're the defender and you're in an area where you control the castle, you get a plus one to your defense there. So it is this quick and easy back and forth to determine who wins the battles. If you happen to control King's Landing, that's gonna give you a plus two in those battles, which is really nice. Now, if you're playing against a non-player character, they will draw a plot card for free and add it to their total. So it's, again, really that simple for battling back and forth. And then when whoever the winner is, is going to get one victory point, you'll move up the track, and you'll be able to basically destroy one of their power units. Now, in doing so, they will remove that unit and put it on their board, or if it was an alliance, they put it back on the boards there. But the neat thing about putting it back on your board is that you gain the resource that it comes down to. And even if it's your hero, you get some nice benefit from that, uh, and you'll be able to bring these forces back to the battlefield. But it does sting to lose these battles for sure, and then you'll have to retreat from that particular domain. And the last type of icon you might use from a plot card in a battle is Conscript. Now this is super powerful. If you have friendly units in adjacent uh, domains around you, you can use their strength to help you in battle and engage and defeat the forces of the other houses and so forth. So battling again, I can't say it enough, just how easy and quick it is to engage with. Now, of all the different domains on the board, one of the most coveted is going to be King's Landing. So in order to take this, once again, you're gonna need at least three castles. And if you do take it, you're gonna grab the Iron Throne and put it in your ally pool, giving you basically a wild plus one against all the other NPCs in the game, which is really fantastic. And like I said, it also gives you a plus two when you defend the area. So those are the main things, the main concepts around the game. And at the end of the round, you're gonna do some checks, like do you have alliances? And you're gonna look to see how many you have in the pool, who has the most, is gonna get that banner of that particular house and be aligned with them. And then you're gonna gain taxes. So you're gonna take a look at your power track and for every slot that is not covered, you'll gain those resources, gold and or plot cards. And then you look out on the main board. For every area you control that's a fief domain, yes, we didn't really talk about those, but those are the domains with coins in them. You can control those and you'll get coins for that too. And at the end of that, if you have control of King's Landing, you get two more. And of course, if you have too many castles and not enough slots for gold, you can't have an excess of gold. You can only take as much gold as you have slots available for. And then finally, you're gonna call your pool, your ally pool. Every player, you can only have two of any one particular type of house in there. So it gives everyone a chance to come back, so to say, and those banners and those alliances to move, which happens a lot in this game. So you'll play this way until you get to the sixth round to final scoring. Remembering, of course, after round three and after five, you're doing some intermediate scoring. And one of the main ways to get points in this game is to reveal your power track. So you can use the point values below those in order to score. So holding your house domain, having thief domains, things like that will give you extra victory points. And you hope in the end to come out on top as the ultimate house and control all of Westeros. All right, folks, just a reminder once again, this has been a Dice Tower paid preview, and everything you've seen here has been in prototype form, so keep a close eye on the campaign for any changes that still may occur. Now, with that said, you know, I'm a fan of Game of Thrones, and they really did nail the theme. You've really felt the political intrigue, 
the swaying of alliances back and forth. You might lose an area just to gain it back. And as you gear up for those different scoring options, another way you might score in the game is by having the most castles. And it, there's a nice breakdown again for a lot of those different things on this round tracker, really handy throughout the game. Also, just all the heroes of the game, like the Starks and the Lannisters, all the things you're gonna be using with their different powers and abilities as you gain even other heroes from the non-players and put them into play to aid you in battle and across all of Westeros. But folks, ultimately, if this looks like something of interest to you, I'm sure they'd appreciate your support. So I think that's it for me, and until next time, we'll see you at the table.